For the longest time, I've kind of always despised what you'd call comfy or cozy games, at least the typical ones like your Animal Crossings, your Stardew Valleys and your Harvest Moons. See, if I've ever wanted to play something nice and cozy, I've always figured there's nothing quite like tucking in under a blanket, putting on some ASMR, turning the volume down nice and low, and warming up with the purgatorial flames of hell while I rip and tear my way through the demonic hordes of Doom Eternal. I've always felt a little bit broken in that regard, but I always took solace in the fact that Animal Crossing fans and, by extension, the fans of most games that brand themselves as comfy games have approximately zero chill and are actually more beast than man, whose hunger for such will never be sated. So with that in mind, maybe my weird habits and tastes aren't actually that bad. But even so, I'd still look at something like Rune Factory and I could see the appeal, but the moment I started playing it, I'd bounce off almost instantly, and before I could even make it out of the basic tutorial, I'd already be considering a homemade lobotomy kit since it would probably be more mentally stimulating by the end of it. Which is a shame, because as I said, I could see the appeal, I just couldn't feel it. Luckily, that changed thanks to Gust and the Atelier series. So, for a bit of context, I want to explain my introduction to Atelier, since it's pretty unusual compared to most. Back when I was about 15, my dad, being the DIY freak that he is, went to a car boot sale where he would pay like 10 quid or something to fill up a cardboard box of whatever you wanted or could find. Naturally, he'd usually come home with what looked like a big box of junk and scrap metal, excitedly showing me all of the great deals that he got, while saying stuff like, can you believe that they'd just be giving this stuff away, and after looking at what was inside I'd respond, yes, I can. This one time was different, however, and when he got home, he came to me and said, Hey Tim, you and your friends like anime, right? And along with the box of doodads that he'd usually get, was seven or eight copies of the Atelier Rorona soundtrack. I appreciated the effort and thought, but at the same time I also had no clue what I was looking at, and I didn't know what I was supposed to do with so many of them. Anyway, due to obvious curiosity, I did do some digging online and learnt more about the series and thought to myself, huh, that's neat. But ultimately, nothing really came of it other than learning the basic gist of the series. You go out, you get materials, you alchemy some stuff up, and you race to meet deadlines. But in the end, I never really got into the series outside of trying to play Atelier Sophie on Steam but the old PC port not working for me. But then, fast forward a few years and Riser got announced and suddenly everybody and their horny dog was talking about Atelier. Or at least one game in the series. Or rather one character from that game. Or rather two body parts of that character. Th th this was all just 2B all over again. But either way, suddenly Atelier was in the zeitgeist and I was constantly reminded that I never got round to trying the series out. And just my luck, the Arland trilogy, the trilogy that had Rorona in it being my only personal connection to the series, was getting a bunch of new ports coming out around this time as well. So I picked up the free games on Switch as my first foyer into the series, and I hated it. Well, not quite, but there were a lot of roadblocks that appeared as I played that wore me down pretty quickly. The time limits were incredibly stressful for someone like me who had a constant nagging feeling telling me that I had to use my time as efficiently as possible, meaning that no matter what decision I made, I felt bad making it. It's funny because I'm no stranger to time limits in games like Persona, and Rorona's three month assignments are significantly longer than any of the dungeon deadlines in those Persona games. The difference is, in the likes of Persona 3, 4 and 5, those time limits are kind of pointless since Dungeons can easily be beaten in a day or two depending on the game, and you have multiple time slots per day to do stuff around that. Rorona on the other hand makes time pass by simply by moving from one location to another, at least outside of town, and because of that, you burn through the time that you have really quickly. Throw in some limited early game resources due to not being able to stockpile items or money, and the fact that you have to pay a fee to bring party members with you, and suddenly I'm double and triple guessing every move that I make. This isn't comfy, nor is it cosy. And ultimately, after only completing two or so assignments, I put the game on pause. 
indefinitely. But that changed last year. I got the flu pretty bad and was overall feeling a little bit burnt out on work, life, videos, etc. And after burning through all of the episodes of Jojo Part 6, I was still feeling pretty ill and miserable. I wasn't able to play anything of high intensity like Bloodborne, Doom or DMC, but all of the turn-based RPGs that I could play at the time were stuff that I was working on videos for and I didn't want to do that since it felt like work. And that's when I noticed I still had Rorona installed on my Switch. So I booted up my save with a new mindset, being that I just wanted to fill the time before I could next pass out and go to sleep. And that was actually the secret ingredient that removed all of my former stress while playing it. And that's what allowed me to play long enough to realize three things. Firstly, I played a lot better when I wasn't stressing most of the time, go figure. Secondly, I had grossly misunderstood the requirements of each assignment, learning that the stuff that I needed to do was not terribly strict, and I only needed to get three of these stars to pass each one, with the top two lines of stars being completely pointless. And finally, I learned that the different character endings are actually tied to specific base endings in the game. And so in my case, I didn't necessarily want to play as optimal as possible to get the quote unquote best ending, since there were much lower requirements to be with my man crush. Ah, Sturkenberg. And it's here where I started to realize and comprehend both the appeal of cozy games, but also why Atelier is as popular as it is. Atelier is a series that I feel perfectly balances its appeal. It doesn't necessarily try and go after everyone, but it does try to have something for everyone. There is a nice, carefree feeling about everything that says, go do what you want, there's no wrong answer to a degree. But the stuff like the time limit and the assignments means that the game isn't aimless like other comfy games that I've tried to play, meaning that the part of my brain that loves problem solving is still able to get its kick. Even then, however, I realized that I was still kind of playing in a way that wasn't really intended. Once Sturk and Esty became party members, I basically never used anyone else, ignoring the likes of Geo, Tantris, and Leonella, partly because I had a really good efficient setup and I didn't want to spread my resources too thin and be unable to meet certain level thresholds for bosses. But also, I didn't want to miss out on any of the character events with the characters I was using, so I chose to ignore half the cast, which, looking back on it, was kind of dumb. Especially when, in the end, I screwed up by focusing on getting 10 stars for an assignment and wasn't able to progress Sturk's questline by fighting the dragon, meaning that I had to settle with the Cory or Esty ending instead. But all in all, I walked away extremely happy that I finally gelled with the game and was able to finish it. That was until I realized that now technically I am an Atelier fan, which means that I've added like 15 plus games to my backlog. Luckily, these games are pretty short, with the modern entries only clocking in around about 20 to 30 plus hours. Maybe a little bit more if you really invest in the side content. Which is still a lot shorter than the usual 50 to 70 plus hours that a lot of the RPGs I like are. So I've realized these games are a really good palette cleanser between releases that I can get through surprisingly quickly, especially with just putting in a few hours here and there before bed to relax. That being said, with the series being as new to me as it is, is, and with me deciding to put off Rorona's post-game due to the inclusion of characters from later games, I decided I still had enough in me to blitz my way through Atelier Totary too. And who knows, maybe this time I'll actually learn how the alchemy system works. Actually, that is something I should mention. I let go so much that I beat Atelier Rorona and was actually able to get the true ending without actually knowing what the hell I was doing. And if that isn't some Ludo narrative bullshit, I don't know what is, because I sure as hell know for a fact Rorona didn't know what she was doing either. In fact, the more I learn about this series, the more I realize that a requirement for being an Atelier protag is being a little bit stupid. They even come available in different flavors. The Arland trilogy alone lets you pick between airheadedness, naivety, and brain damage. But on to Totary. I was ready with a full Atelier game of experience under my belt now, and with the lessons that I had learned, I was ready to tackle what 
I once read as the Dark Souls of the Atelier series. And I have to say, as far as time management is concerned, I don't think that's necessarily untrue. You're given a lot more time with six years compared to the three that you get with Verona, but on the flip side, you burn through that time even quicker with even things like random battles taking up half a day. The old me probably would have cracked under the pressure, but the new me was a big boy now and isn't afraid of games made for girls anymore. And in the end, Totary was an excellent second game for me to play once I'd found my footing with the series. While I didn't quite as enjoy it as much as I did Rorona, I did get to experience a lot of what I feel is the core aspects of the Atelier series, as Totary's much more open structure of hitting multiple milestones in various categories such as alchemy, battles and exploration etc meant I was focusing on just doing Atelier things and not looking for main plot which is kinda what I was trying to do with Verona. And this whole feeling of getting the true Atelier experience was also further enhanced by the fact that Totary, unlike Verona, at least in Plus, is 100% reliant on items to be useful in combat. So I couldn't be my usual item hoarding self like I was in my first foyer with the series, and I actually had to fight like an alchemist. Because of this, I actually tried out multiple different characters in my party this time. Or at least I tried to, but my biases of having Morona and Sturk in my party at all times did start to crop up over time. Despite that, however, I actually did end up accidentally putting in the work to get the Melvia ending, which I ended up appreciating quite a bit, as despite being a character ending, it still felt like a very proper conclusion to the game, since a lot of the character endings are very much joke outcomes. Granted, there is a true ending that requires you to get every single character ending on a single run to see, but that's what YouTube is for. With that all being said, while I did enjoy my time with Totary, and I think it was a really good second game for me to play, I do feel like a lot of its content was very much back-ended, with the first four years of the game being dedicated to just earning the right to access the story's actual content. Totary's structure taught me how to actually play Atelier and appreciate it for what it is, but I don't see myself wanting to jump onto a second playthrough since the direction of Rorona was ultimately what made me resonate with the series in the first place, even if the story was just as sparse as it was in Totary. I don't want to come off as negative with Totary though, because even though I don't fully love the structure that much, I still had some really great moments in the game. Multiple clutch moments, like, like when I was fighting the big sea monster, the Flouse Trout, and it had me down to just Sturk, who had his super on deck, and as he performed it and walked away saying, this is still not enough. I realised that Sturk was in fact right, and the giant fish was surviving with a magic pixel of health. But when it counterattacked, my homeboy pulled through and was left standing with 2 HP, which was just enough to secure the dub. And in that moment, I absolutely popped off. Also, Rorona killed Satan by just squishing him, so anything bad I have to say about this game is completely made invalid. Now, at this point, Meruru is obviously the next step in my journey, and I have started it, though I haven't gotten too deep into it yet. And I'll probably save Meruru and Lulua for another video, but I will say that catching a mere whiff of the town building system with Meruru has me very intrigued, so I'm super excited to jump on that. Granted, I'm also worried that if any game in the series does get a plus or a DX edition in the future, the next one will be Lulua, so I don't necessarily want to hop on that immediately after Meruru, but I'm not entirely sure. I also just really want to jump on the Dust trilogy, because I love Hidari's art style so much. It's like having three new Fire Emblem Echoes games. And with that all being said, I have been planning future endeavours with the series as well. I've picked up Riser 1 and Nelke for dirt cheap on PS4 after discovering that the main motivation of Riser becoming an alchemist is that she doesn't want to be a farmer. And I've also nabbed the Dust Trilogy on Steam when it was on sale, and have been looking into ways to mod it to get rid of some of the quirks that I'm not particularly fond of of those ports, so I'm more than ready for the future. The Atelier games didn't only teach me to love Atelier though, my adjusted mindset has also allowed me to give other games a chance that I hadn't before. I've only dabbled with them so far, but I have also gotten around to playing both Harvestella and Sakuna of Rice and Ruin, and I can safely say that 
I can tolerate farming now, hell, I can even enjoy it under the right context. Harvest Stella's farming seems like it's guilty of many of the things that I've disliked about it in the past, but I'm a lot more willing to allow it when the aesthetic in the world is a lot more enticing. Especially when the 3D art style makes me think of what a more realistically proportioned Bravely Default would look like if BD2 hadn't landed in some weird, uncanny valley middle ground like it did. And I'm not entirely sure how true it is, but I was also told that the farming becomes less important the further and further you get in, so that's always a plus, at least for me. But even so, after playing it more and more, I can also say that I can enjoy farming in the same semi-ironic way that I enjoy fishing minigames in JRPGs, something I can do here as well. It's also super basic, but I'm always a huge fan of anything that has a job system in it, so Harvestella's kind of just won me over on that. Actually, come to think of it, I should have probably named my character Jack. Sakuna of Rice and Ruin, on the other hand, is just a dope-ass 2D character action game. Shit looks like a 3D Muramasa rebirth, but plays like the Odin Sphere remaster with a sick tether gimmick that really opens up the combo system. And after Muramasa Rebirth being kind of a disappointment outside of its short DLC campaigns, it's cool that this setting and aesthetic can be used for a full game of this type, even if it doesn't have the vanillaware art style. Though, that's a video for another time. Sakuna's farming, on the other hand, is quite interesting. You've only got one patch of land and one crop to grow, but the process is so much more meticulous than simply press X to hoe, press Y to water, press A to harvest. It's so much more in depth than that. And the idea of intentionally controlling the water level and adjusting it depending on how the weather is, and manually having to space the rice huskers apart simply based off feel, means that the actual process of everything is really engaging. Or at the very least just a lot more engaging of what farming games usually have. It's still not the sort of thing I'd like to play all the time, but when it's paired up with a great combat system, I'm more than willing to try it out for the few weird quirks that it has. Either way, I'm really glad that I was able to break through that barrier that I kind of had towards these games, especially Atelier, because there really seems to be some great stuff in these games, and I can really understand why people like them so much. And Gust in general, for that matter. I really want to give Blue Reflection a try, and I remember playing a little bit of Knights of Azure back in the day and really digging it. It felt really cheap, but it was still really charming, so I want to give Gust a really good fair shake now, because so far everything of theirs that I've played has resonated with me a decent amount. Uh, I've really enjoyed what I have played, so that's definitely something to keep an eye on in future. The moral of this story, I guess, is don't be afraid to try out new things or something, I don't know. Like, is there a series or genre that you guys are interested in, but just haven't been able to break through that initial barrier to entry? Because I know I've had a few in the past and I've managed to get through most of them, but... Because I know, it can be a bit of a struggle when you really, really want to like something, but for some reason you just can't get into it. Either way, I'm not entirely sure how to end this, since this has been a bit of a rambling vlog video in general, so um... Yeah, play Atelier, it's cool. <laughs>